Today we're going to talk a little bit about one of those unusual days where despite all the research, the right people, and the right equipment, pure luck was really the element that came through for us on this particular day. We're talking about a day about a year after we found the Margarita main pile. And here you see a picture of the swordfish, which I was the captain of, working on the Margarita. You'll note that the anchor lines are pulled tight from the stern and the bow. That's firmly holding the, the boat in position while we excavate. The prop wash deflectors are in the down position, so they are not visible in this picture because they're underwater. And the ship's propellers are driving water through the downward pointing elbow shaped tubes. And uh, we use those to blow away the sand uh, that covered the margarita artifacts that were scattered along the artifact trail. This particular trip had been a long one and we hadn't had a lot of luck. Uh, it was my intention to set the boat up in a place that we hadn't worked before, but nearby a place one of our other company boats had had some luck prior. So I had some relatively new crew members on board and I asked them to jump over the side with their tanks on and kind of guide me to the point near where this other vessel had stopped its digging so we could pick up the trail from that point. Unfortunately, these folks were so new to the game that they couldn't really decipher uh, the, the bottom features and tell me if the area had been previously excavated or not. That brought about a great deal of frustration because it was a really hot day and uh, we were all kind of suffering from it's long-term sun exposure and heat. So in frustration, I finally put a mask and fins on and just jumped over the side and swam to the area where I thought that this new area would be and where we should start digging. So once I was in the water, I had the first mate of the boat winch the vessel over into position and uh, I told him to start digging. Yeah, maybe not very long, maybe about a 30 second mid-throttle excavation just to find out how deep the sand was. I didn't want to come back up the dive ladder, so I just hung on the mailbox frame, the, uh, the, the ropes that you see at the back of the, of the vessel and this somewhat submerged tubing and piping, the support structure for the uh, prop wash deflectors back there. And I waited till the excavation was over, and uh, my plan was to uh, go down, do a free dive, make sure that we'd blown enough sand away, and then I'd allow the divers who were up on the schedule next to, to go down and metal detect and check out the hole. By the way, this is kind of what it looks like underwater. Here you can see the uh, prop wash deflectors in the fully down position. This photo was actually taken by Don Kincaid out on the Margarita site. And uh, as you can see, the, the sand is being uh, kind of blown away uh, by the, the thrust coming down from the, the boat above and the margarita has very strong current so all that cloud of silt and sand is very quickly taken away and it leaves an excavation. Most of the sand uh, on the margarita site was very shallow, anywhere from just a, an inch or so to maybe a foot or two feet of sand and very loose so it was an easy place for us to dig. We actually like digging the margarita a lot because of the great ease of exposing the artifacts uh, that, that were distributed along the, the path of destruction of the wrecked galleon. So again, I was clinging to the, the mailbox frame, my head above water. As soon as the, uh, the blowers were done digging, I took a quick breath and then swam down, just a mask and fins on, no scuba tank, to see what was the sand configuration in this particular spot. That was my whole entire uh, intent, was just to see how deep the sand was so the divers could go on and check the hole out. If we needed to dig longer, then I could come up and advise the first mate that we needed a little bit more digging before they came down. Otherwise, uh, uh, my mission was pretty much done after I saw the, the sand uh, conditions on the bottom. So I dove down, and from a distance, as the cloud of sand started to disperse in the current, I noticed something unusual. I saw this kind of glinting gold square or rectangular object right underneath where the blowers had been clearing away the sand. And I kind of, it was still a little bit murky. The sand uh, cloud hadn't really been taken away completely. And I continued down deeper than I planned on. And uh, when I got close, this is what I saw. There was a square of gold on the bottom, a line just like what you see here in the photograph. And uh, 
I grabbed all of it without a thought and uh, kicked up off the bottom and went wailing back up to the surface. This is what the entirety was. Uh, as you can see, nine gold bars, eight gold chains, about 26 pounds of gold that had all been in some sort of a box. The box was long gone, it wasn't there anymore, uh, but the contents certainly were. And so, uh, fortunately, there was somebody on the boat that caught me just as my head popped up from uh, the seafloor. Now you can see some of the gold and the chain in my hands, 26 pounds of gold. This momentary picture captured the second or so that my head was actually above the water before the weight of the gold actually pulled me back under and I had a heck of a time swimming back to the boat without dropping anything. I uh, was pretty amazed to have it all. Obviously the folks on board the boat did not expect me to come up uh, holding gold bars and gold chains. So uh, here I am back on deck safely with, uh, with the uh, stuff that was obviously uh, in a box at one time, uh, one of the wealthy passengers' personal belongings, and some of the gold chains. You can see the gold chains ranged in size from medium link all the way down to tiny link chains. There's also, nearby, we found this carved ivory lid to a box. And our presumption at the time, and still is, is that this is a portion of the box that originally contained the gold chains, the gold bars. It was a fragment. The rest of uh, the box was lost to history. But at least uh, we had uh, found this one unique piece, and there's nothing else like it on the margarita that was found. And uh, again, our theory is still holds today that this probably was the lid to the box that contained all that gold. Here you can see again some of the different sizes of chain that were in the box. Uh, these were money chains, any gold that you could wear as jewelry. Back in those days, you didn't have to pay taxes on. And so you could pay for things by just taking links off the chain. The, chain, the chains were very high uh, carat quality. They're all 23 and 3 quarter carats, so the same carat as uh, gold coins of that day. So uh, if you're a wealthy person, you could wear some of your wealth in, in the form of jewelry like this, but you could still buy things with it by just taking links off the chain. Here's uh, some of the other gold bars that were there. The, the one in the middle you can see was actually had the ends chiseled off of it. Uh, they had, uh, this bar had been used as partial payment for something in its past. You can still see tax stamps on them. 21 and 22 carats were what most of the bars were. And even this really small chain was there. This is a little bit unusual. We didn't find that much really small chain. And there's another portion of a gold bar that had obviously been chiseled off of a larger one. So yeah, and all of this is sitting on a silver plate that's still showing the calcareous material on it. Um, in addition to the gold chains uh, and the gold bars there, you can also see that piece of uh, ivory lid uh, and the silver plate. We also found a silver bar and a silver ewer or pitcher nearby. The silver bar has a lot of calcareous uh, concretion on it as well as silver sulfide. This is typical of the margarita silver. The margarita again was the artifacts were fairly exposed to uh, high oxygen levels uh, and it was a shallow water wreck site. So the artifacts were much different condition than the ones that we found on the Atocha which were better preserved in the deep mud. At least the artifacts on the main pile of the Atocha were much better preserved. So uh, you can see here some other shots of some of the, the pieces from that particular day. And uh, one of the company boats came up alongside us as we were on our way back into Key West at the end of our trip. And of course we had to show off. You can see some of our crew members all holding bits of gold and gold chains uh, showing off uh, to get their pictures taken from the other company boat. And of course when we arrived back in port, Mel was there to greet us and uh, welcome in uh, the, the latest finds on the Margarita site. So probably the richest free dive that I know of uh, in modern day times. Obviously, uh, the original Spanish salvers used free divers to recover artifacts from the Margarita and even some from the Atocha. Uh, we had it a lot luckier because at least I had a mask and fins. They didn't have that. They had a big rock to hang on to and they jumped over the side to feel around on the bottom for artifacts. So I had a little bit easier time than they did. but. I don't know anyone else that has done a free dive like that on either of the 1622 fleet sites that we worked and re recovered that much on a free dive. So 
Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more, uh, you can, of course, read my book, Atocha Treasure Adventures, Sweat of the Sun, Tears of the Moon. You can go to our website, uh, Atocha Treasure Adventures, and there's lots more videos and pictures like this that are going to be coming out. So please press like, and uh, we'll present more of these as time goes on. Thanks for watching.